Okay, and then Ephesians 4.26, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now this verse talk about that do not, in your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So he's talking about not to let sins control you, and then when you sin, you give the devil a foothold. So he's talking about sins will bring, will give the devil a foothold. So sin will give the devil the chance to attack us and to steal from us. So we don't want to continue in sin. And John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. So, uh, and then uh, Jesus came that he'll give us life and life uh, abundantly. So the thief will come to steal, kill, and destroy. And uh, when a person continues sin, he'll give the devil a foothold, and the devil will come to steal, kill, and destroy. So the first point of our fruit of salvation, remember this we talked about, the fruit of salvation is to repent of our sins and turn away from sins. Now there are some people who just, you know, repent of the sins, but they continue to sin again. When we repent of a sin, we say sins are destructive, and we hate the sins, so we say no to sins, and then we don't want to sin again. And, uh, but if the sinful thoughts come again, immediately we stop it. We know that it's destructive. That's the key to uh, saying no to sin, is to stop the sinful thought immediately when a sinful thought appears. And then we will go to the next point about uh, the fruits of salvation. Okay, uh, let me... Uh, restate the fruits again, the repentance and turning away from sin and trust in Jesus as Savior and Master and then close relationship with God and love God and obey God and serve God. Okay, continue trust in Jesus as Savior, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. So when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, it means we receive Him, receive Him. So we let Him be our Lord. We let Him be our Lord. It's not just believing in the head, but uh, let Him be our Lord that uh, then we are a, a Christian. If a Christian doesn't let Jesus take over his life at all, he just lets sin control, uh, according to the first point, then when, con when he continues sin, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So when a Christian doesn't let God, let Jesus be his Lord, be his master, then he's not saved because then sin will take uh, over his life, uh, sin will control his life, and then he's not a Christian. So as a Christian, we always let Jesus uh, be our master and be our savior. And then have a close relationship with God, okay? The, remember the third and fourth point is related to relationship. Have a close relationship. Uh, in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and, they, and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Okay, now here, uh, it says that Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. That he who abides in Jesus, that means have a relationship with him, who lives in Jesus. And then Jesus will live in him. When Jesus lives in us, he will speak to us, he will guide us. He will bring us to repentance and bring us to obedience, to follow him. And then for a person who have a close relationship with God, he lives in Jesus, and Jesus lives in him, then he will bear much fruit. So here it says that the necessary result of salvation he is he will have the relationship with Jesus and it will bring much fruit. Without Jesus abiding in him, we cannot bear fruit because Jesus is the source of life. When Jesus is there, there will be will bear fruit. So when Jesus lives there, will for sure bear fruit. So uh, bearing fruit is a necessary consequence of salvation. When a person is saved for sure, he will bear fruit. And without me, without Jesus, we can do nothing. 
And if anyone does not abide in Jesus, and he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. So for those who don't abide in Jesus, so who don't have a close relationship with Jesus, then they are thrown outside and is withered and will be thrown into the fire. So this is hell. So people who don't have a close relationship with God will lose salvation. Now, um, what is this relationship? This relationship has to have the result that Jesus will speak to the person and the person will respond. Now, of course, there are Christians who respond to Jesus all the time. He obeys Jesus all the time. He responds to Jesus all the time. And there are Christians who respond to Jesus only once in a while. He still has this relationship, but his relationship is weak. As long as he has this relationship that Jesus speaks to him, and he responds to Jesus, and he relates to Jesus, that he has a continual relationship with Jesus, he is still saved. But if his relationship is very weak, then he can be under attack any time because he can sin any time and give the devil a foothold and it could be dangerous. Now some people don't have strong motivation to have a close relationship with God and then they will give the devil a foothold. So we want to keep a close relationship with God. What does that mean? To read the Bible, to meditate on the Bible and to pray to Him and thank Jesus all the time and love Jesus, praise Him when we praise Jesus, then Jesus will work in our life. He will stay in our heart and He will change our life and He, and he will speak to us. And then we will, uh, as a born again Christian, we want to respond to God. If a Christian doesn't respond to God at all, if God continues to tell him to repent and he doesn't repent at all, if we have zero repentance, he's not saved. But when he has this repentance, then he's saved. But there are different degrees of spiritual life. Some Christians are very strong and actually they will be blessed by God because He will be full of the fruits of the Holy Spirit and also God is pleased with them and they seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be given to them. To those who love Him, that He'll prepare things that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard and the human mind cannot think of, that God will prepare all these blessings for Him for those who have a close relationship with God. For those who don't have a close relationship with God, what happens is He will suffer in many ways, in personal relationship, in His emotions, uh, because, uh, also because of the sins and the uh, attack of Satan because of His sins, then He will suffer. So when we don't have a close relationship with God, we'll suffer. Now the motivation to have a close relationship with God is saying, Oh, God is the source of all goodness. So Jesus is the source of life, of spiritual life and blessings. And He is happy whenever I come to Him. Even when I'm weak, I come to Jesus and Jesus is very happy and He will strengthen me. So we continue to have the motivation. Yes, Lord is the source of life. He's the source of blessings. He's the source of strength. So I want to come to Him and rely on Him. And then my life is strengthened. So that's motivation by the grace of God. Now, the motivation by, uh, by warning, uh, that is secondary. They're saying that if we don't abide in Him, then we are thrown out and then we'll wither and be thrown in the fire. Uh, that should be a reminder, but should not be the main motivation. Christians should not be saying, oh, if I don't pray, then I'll be thrown in the fire. We should not be doing this, but we should be saying, God is full of blessings. When I follow Him and when I have a close relationship with Him, then He'll have a close relationship with me and I'll enjoy His life all the time and I'll enjoy spiritual life and I will have strength. That way He enjoys His spiritual life. He, he is full of spiritual strength that is motivated by the grace of God. Okay, So I hope you all understand that. When we teach people, we don't just say, you have to pray, you have to read the Bible. We say, the Bible is full of the Word of God. It's full of promises. When you hold on to these promises, you have strength, you have joy. And, and you follow this, uh, this Word of God, the promises, then God will bless your whole life. So that will give people the motivation. Okay, and then the fourth fruit is love God with all our heart. 
that Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So God is full of love. And so the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. So when we are a, king, a, a, a son of a kingdom of God, then we also want to love God. You know, in the kingdom of God is full of love. God will love his people and his people will love him and the people will love each other. So when we are a child of God, we want to continue to love God. He is the source of all blessings. He loves us so much. He cares about us so much that the first commandment is to love God above all things. So that is the necessary result of salvation, to love God with all our heart. And then this is a warning, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Now this is a warning. If a person doesn't love Jesus at all, let him be accursed. So this is a warning. But we should not be saying, oh, I need to love Jesus. If not, he'll curse me. Instead, we'll say, when I love Jesus, Jesus is very happy. Jesus loves me all the time. He accepts me all the time. You know, people who went to heaven, they said when they saw Jesus, Jesus showed perfect acceptance. And there was one person who saw Jesus, and then he, he was on the operation table, and then his soul left the body. And he saw his body, his, his body on the operation table, and the doctors were working on him. And he saw that the glory of God was on his body, and his body was beautiful. And then he saw Jesus by his side, and Jesus said to him, In my eyes, you are always beautiful like that. That is, you know, that also uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, that it says that, that we are like a bridegroom, a bride, that we are, you know, that we are covered with the righteousness of Christ, of the righteousness of God, that we are beautiful. So God sees us as beautiful because we have the righteousness of Christ and God accepts us. People who went to heaven, they say, wow, Jesus really accepts them and loves them. And so anytime we think of Jesus, we say, Oh Lord, you are happy with me. Especially when I love you, when I obey you, when I glorify you. You are very happy with me. So every day we can be joyful. Now this is the source of joy that we know that Jesus is happy with me when I trust in Jesus as my Savior. Jesus, you are my Lord. I thank you. I love you. I adore you. So we trust in Jesus as our Savior. And God is very happy with me. God is smiling over me. God is smiling at me. And so we can be very, very happy. So when God is so wonderful, we want to love Him too. When we love Him, He is very, very happy. So there is warning about not loving Jesus, but we don't want to be that to be the main motivation. The main motivation should be the grace of God. He is full of blessings. He is full of grace. He loves us all the time. He has prepared so many blessings for us. And then when I love Him, He will prepare for things eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and the human mind cannot think of. So He has all these blessings for me, so I willingly love God. And God is very happy, and I can enjoy my spiritual life. So I hope we all enjoy our spiritual life with God. Okay, now we come to the sixth point to obey God, especially the Great Commission. In Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now here in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, there are people who pray, Lord, 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 not all of them will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That means to obey God, obey the will of God that is in the word of God. The, the will of God is for us to love God with all our heart and love people as ourselves and preach the gospel 
and whatever Jesus has taught us, we teach them. So this is what we obey and obey everything the Bible teaches us. And then those who don't obey, that uh, only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who don't, then they don't go to heaven. And then there will be many who say to Jesus on that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? So some people prophesy in Jesus' name and cast out demons and then uh, also uh, uh, done many wonders. But Jesus said, I don't know you. Now why doesn't Jesus know them? Because they just superficially serve God externally. But in their spiritual life, they don't have a relationship with God. They don't obey God in their spiritual life. They just do ministry. Some people do ministry as a job. And even there are some churches that do ministry and they believe in that homosexuality is okay, that God accepts that, that the Bible is very clear about that. God hates homosexuality. And, but then there are some churches, some pastors who say, who, who say that it's okay to be homosexual. And so there are people who don't follow the Bible and they don't obey God in their spiritual life, then they are not saved, even though they do the external <coughs> superficial thing. They are not born again. They don't have the real spiritual life. So now there are Christians like this. You probably have heard of this Christians who go to church and also they commit adultery or they have lust all the time. They chase after different girls and they um, mistreat the wife and they tell lies and they steal money from the church. And there are Christians who live like that. There are even pastors who steal from the church. There is great danger that they might not be saved. Now, what if a Christian, he obeyed God in certain way and then he disobeyed God in certain ways? Now, I'm not God. I cannot judge them. But if a Christian who do certain things, but then they will steal money from the church, that means they don't feel guilty about stealing from the church. Or some Christians so-called Christians, they commit adultery and then they don't feel sorry for their sins. That means even when they obey certain commandments of God, they are not really obeying God. They're just following some external rules in their heart. They're not afraid to sin. And this is very dangerous. Now, it's, it's not that you know, a Christian have zero good works, then they will go to hell. Some, sometimes some Christians have some good works because some people naturally have some good works. They, they're kind to people, they're nice to people, they're nice to their friends, but they commit adultery and then they steal from the church and then they gossip and spread gossip about people or uh, uh, say something false against other people and uh, or they cause division in the church so they sin without repentance there is a danger that they are sinning without you know they they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them to remind them of their sins or they are rejecting the Holy Spirit so there is a danger that they're not saved even though they do some good works they might give some money to the church uh, superficially. They might do some good things in the church. They might help in the church. But at the same time, they are committing some sins that shows that they are not responding to the Holy Spirit. There is a danger. Now, I'm not, I cannot judge them and say they cannot go to heaven. I, it's only God who can tell who can go to heaven. But what I'm saying is when Christians commit sins without repentance, without feeling sorry, there is a danger that he's not responding to the Holy Spirit and he's rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit that he might not be saved. So 
we need to warn people. But at the same time, the main motivation should be that when we obey God, we are building on the firm foundation, on the solid rock, and then God is happy with us, and then God will reward us and strengthen us and bless our life. Our life will go higher and higher. And uh, so there is positive motivation to obey God. When I obey God in every way I can, God is pleased with me and God will bless my whole life and I can enjoy my life. And that is wonderful. So that is, should be the main motivation. The reminder from Matthew 7, 21 to 23 is a warning to people who think that it's okay to sin, to commit certain sin, and then they say, I've done something good. You know, I sing in the choir, I'm the usher in the church, I help in the church, I clean up the church, but at the same time, they steal money from the church. Now, when they do the ushering in the church, or they sing the choir in the choir, or do the cleanup work, it can be external good works, that they're not really obeying God from the heart. And then when they steal money from the church, they are actually saying, you know, God doesn't see or I just repent and ask God to forgive me and it will be okay. Now, that's very wrong to say that, okay, I steal from God and then I will say sorry. That is very, very wrong. That we must understand that this is, this is serious sin. And or some, or some people say, okay, I, I don't like my wife and my wife doesn't like me, so I just have another woman. And, and they think it's okay and it can be dangerous that they might not be saved. So the secondary motivation is the reminder that they, could not, they might not be saved. And the main motivation should be that God is so full of grace and mercy. I obey Him, God is pleased with me, and God is happy with me, and He bless my life and raise my life to a higher, higher level. Okay, and then number six, serve God. Now many Christians think that only pastors serve God and Christians don't have to serve God. Regular laymen don't have to serve God. But in Matthew 25, it's very clear. Okay, in Matthew 25, now first I want to explain serving God includes glorifying God and blessing people in Jesus in daily life and in ministry. So it means that we glorify God and tell people about the good things of God and bless people to bring them to Jesus or to bless the Christians, to help the Christians to grow in Jesus, to help the church to grow, you know, anything that will build up the kingdom of God. So this is serving God. Anything we do to strengthen other Christians or bring people to believe in Jesus. So we don't have to be a minister to serve God. And every Christian has the responsibility. In Matthew 25, there are, two, there are three parables. Three, the three parables about the end time. The first parable is about the ten virgins. Now, the oil should represent salvation or the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, those people who don't have, this, have salvation or the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life, then they are not saved. And then the second and third parable are about bearing fruit of serving God. The second parable is the parable of the talents. There are three servants. One received five talents, one received two talents, one received one talent, and then the master sent them to use the money, and then the one with five talents earned five talents. And then the master say, you're a good and faithful servant, and you can come and enjoy the happiness of your master. And then the one with the two talents also are a good and faithful servant and enjoy the happiness of the master. And then the one uh, who has the one talent buried the talent, that means he doesn't use his talent. The talent represents our ability, our resource, our money, everything we have. If we don't use it for God's kingdom, then Jesus will come back and say, you haven't used it. And then, and then the master said, you can at least you know, lease the money to the banker and then you can get the interest back. That, that should mean offering, you know, that you can use the money for offering and then people can use the money to build up the kingdom of God and then you have not used it. You just use the money for yourself. Then they are uh, cast into the outer darkness where they will gnash the teeth. Now some people say this is not hell. You know, they say there is heaven, hell, and there is a place of gnashing the teeth. There's no such description in the Bible. From the whole Bible, it's either 
heaven or hell. There is no third place. Some people say this is a third place. It's, it's misinterpreting the Bible. And uh, because the Bible is very clear that in many places that he who do good works, you know, will rise and have eternal life. And those who don't do good works and then who are wicked will rise and have eternal uh, punishment. So it's very clear that only two results, no third result. It's only heaven or hell. So the ones who don't use the talents. And then the third parable is very clear. It's about the sheep and the goats. So when Jesus descend in Matthew 25, it says that Jesus descend in his glory with the angels. And then he will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep, he said to them, he says to them that you have done all these things to, the, to me. And then they say, when did we do it to you? And then Jesus said, you do it to one of the, my, little, my little brothers. Then you do it to me. So whatever we do to bless the uh, children of God. So it says very clearly here, it's not just doing good to the world. It's doing good to the Christians. So you have done it to the, my brothers. You have done it to me. And then you can inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you. And then you have eternal life. And then those who don't do it to Jesus, they say, when did we do it to you? And Jesus said, you didn't do it to my brothers. Then you do it, did not do it to me. And you will go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So, so these people who don't serve God, who don't glorify God, who don't uh, bless other Christians, they will go into eternal fire. So this is very clear that serving God is necessary. Now some people might say, well, how about the thief, the thief on the cross? Uh, when did he have a chance to serve God? But actually, you know, on the cross, he did this. He said to the other thief, you know, he said that you and I deserve this punishment, but he has never done anything bad. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when your kingdom comes. So he is glorifying God in public. He's already serving God. And then for some people who are on a dying bed and they in the last moment, they say, yes, Lord Jesus. They are already glorifying God in a certain way. Of course, this is minimal serving God. They only have that little time. And then for Christians who live for a long period of time, then we should use our talents to bless other people, to build up the church, to preach the gospel, to bring more people in the kingdom of God and help the church to grow and glorify God and use our life. And then for those who don't, those who don't do it to the Christians, then Jesus will say, they, you have eternal damnation. That's in Matthew 25. Okay, and then, um, so the fruit of salvation, it's the sixth fruit is serving God. It's not, we're not saved by serving God. We're saved by faith. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But when we are saved, then we'll also bear fruit of serving God. So here the Bible verse is that, that you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and then receive back my, uh, my own with interest. And then you are an unprofitable servant that you'll be cast out into the outer darkness. There will be whipping and the gnashing of teeth. So that is hell. And then uh, the third parable that those who are faithful will inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And then uh, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then, uh, so this is a necessary fruit of salvation. And then those who did not do it to Jesus' brothers, depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. As you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Therefore, you go into everlasting punishment. And those who have not done good to Jesus, brothers, they were thrown into the fire. So this is very clear that the necessary fruit of salvation, the result of salvation uh, is uh, serving God. So um, the <coughs> we look at this six points again, that 
the necessary fruit of salvation. But again, I want to say we don't force people to bear this fruit, but we tell them, God has a wonderful plan in your life. He has so many blessings. He blesses you so abundantly. And then when we totally take Jesus to be our Savior and as, our, as our Lord, He will bless our whole life. And then the Holy Spirit will move in our heart. It's not, it's not us who bear fruits. It's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, bears fruit in our lives. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, He will bear fruit and He will change our life. So when you continue to repent, so when we're saved, then we continue to repent and turn away from sins and continue to trust in Jesus as Savior and Master. So these two are related to salvation because when we are saved, we repent of our sin and trust in Jesus as Savior and as our Master. And then related to relationship with God, that they, we continue to have a close relationship with Him and love Him. And then related to good works that will continue to obey God and serve God. And so these are the necessary fruit of salvation.